good evening and very good morning to one and all present here in this webinar i thank you all for sparing out your valuable time and being a part of this webinar organized by markpatron.org and sponsored by hk achary and company this is your host jalashree dave for this webinar and a part of markpatron.org i warmly welcome all of you we hope you are staying positive and testing negative with this webinar we are accessible to a global audience that brings together wide and varied group of people connecting in this digital world namaste before i start i would like to give a quick introduction about our organizer and co-organizers so first markpatent.org markpatent.org established in 2004 is actively associated and dedicated to the support and advancement of intellectual property elements the main object of the organization is to provide in depth understanding and to create awareness of intellectual property right among attorneys advocates professors law students and also among manufacturers industrialists traders and the general public markpatent.org undertakes various activities at local national and international levels by organizing trade fairs exhibitions seminars lectures and study circle activities to propagate the knowledge of intellectual property laws to the layman and thus creating awareness developing recognition and acceptance of the intellectual property rights second the zaviers research foundation Xavier's Research Foundation Trust runs the Loyola Center for Research and Development, an autonomous institute which was established in the year 1987 in St. Xavier's College, Ahmedabad. Its goal is to do research in science and technology and also in humanities. The center not only provides scientific staff dedicated to research, but also provides infrastructural support and expertise to the student working on the frontline research field in environment by microbiology and plant biotechnology school of law gujarat university the university school of law in the gujarat university was established in 1977 and is one of the highest ranked law colleges not only in gujarat but also occupies a top spot in the ranking at the national level it offers a two year full time llm courses in intellectual property rights icfai law school hyderabad the faculty of law commonly known as icfai law school is a constituent unit of the icfai foundation for higher education located in the lust green environment in the vicinity of historical city of hyderabad the icfai law school with excellent and continuous teaching and learning process student centric and industry friendly dynamic curriculum and real life exposure provide best in class legal education to the student and carrying them to market ready legal professions out of the mediocre student who desire to making law as a career us iic the us iic us india importers council aims to be the leading organization assisting government bodies industry association corporates agent and india importers as well as american importers in the united states and india in the mutual beneficial exchange of products services and technologies and in forming meaningful trade partnerships through dissemination of practice and relevant information through the creation of networking platform the us india importers council act as an intermediary organization to facilitate partnership and the trade between india and american businesses and thus acting as a catalyst promoting for the economic growth between united states and india last but not the least nirma university nirma university founded on the vision of padma shri dr karsan bhai k patel the institute of law nirma university embodying the principles of justice education excellence and professionalism that imparts quality legal education and produce new generation lawyers leaders and policy makers over the year once again we are thankful to our organizer and co organizers so now moving forward may i please welcome our dignitaries managing trustee at markpatent.org and proprietor of hk acharya and company dr rajesh kumar acharya our honorable chief guest managing director at concord biotech limited mr sudhir vaid our mentor and senior advisor projects and ipr domain expert mr padmin buch partner herald cabinet the advocates the affairs paris in france mr richard milkior us pto registered patent attorney at golab golab intellectual property dr marjo mario golab patent attorney managing partner of quan and kim patent and trademarks attorney mr yu jung kwan 
assistant professor at ICFAI Law School, Mr. Dilip Sharma, and patent attorney at HKR Charan Company, Ms. Kim Jal Shah. I heartily welcome all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya, Managing Trustee at MarkPatent.org and proprietor of HKHR and Company. He is a patent and trademark attorney and is registered to practice law before Indian and Canadian trademark and patent offices. He is also a member of the Bar Council of Gujarat and having an extensive background in prosecution and litigations of all IP related matters. He is best known for the books on the IPR laws in India, which includes the patent law, the trademark law, the copyright law, the biological diversity law, and the design law. He has accumulated a wealth of experience in prosecution and litigation of patent, trademark, design, copyrights, and other intellectual property related matters. He is also a member of various national and international organizations related to IPR. He is also a member of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and the president of US chapter of US IIC, that is United States India Importers Council. So with my utmost pleasure, I invite Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya before you to share his piece of wisdom. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Janashree. I welcome all of you. I don't know whether should I say good evening, good morning, good afternoon, because we have speakers from US, where it is a early morning. Also, we have speakers in the France, we have speakers from Korea, uh, also from India, and also the same thing, we have the audience from all around the globe. So, it is rather, I'll say that it is a good time, whatever it is. So, markpatent.org, it is an organization for educating and spread awareness of intellectual property. And we are organizing seminars and workshops in IP since more than 15 years. But since last one and a half year, because of this uh, pandemic situation in the world, we are organizing this webinar. And it is rather more comfortable to all of us. The reason that whatever the time it is, we can attend this webinar. And in this webinar now, instead of general IP, we are be becoming more deductive. This time it is patenting and biotech biomedical research. Particularly when it is to be a, do the patent drafting for biotech or biomedical research. Friends, you know it is an, not easy thing for drafting a biomedical or biotech invention for the patent. Because biomedical or biotechnical invention it composes mechanical, electrical, electronic, pharmaceuticals, chemical, many things in one invention. So at the time of the drafting, all the patent attorneys, particularly drafting the biotech or biomedical research patent, we have to be very, very careful to cover these many technologies into one patent. So this time we thought that let us have becoming more deductive so we can understand how to draft and when to draft this biomedical and biotechnical patent. And we have very, very, very appropriate person as our chief guest, Mr. Sudhir Vaid, who is a basically biotechnologist. He's having his own Concord Biotech Limited, and they, they are doing wonderful job in the as far as research is concerned, and their factory, it is wonderful factory. They are doing a very, very advanced job. Welcome, Sudhir Bhai. Uh, I would also like to welcome our mentor, 
friend, philosopher, guide, always with us since our first seminar long time back, Mr. Padmin Bhai Buch, who is also having pharmaceutical background and also he is a very good IPR consultant. So welcome Padmin Bhai. And we have a galaxy of speakers today, expert in that field. Speaker from France, Mr. Richard Milchio. Welcome, Richard, to our webinar. Also, I welcome Mr. Mario Golab, who is also speaker many times with us and giving us a benefit of their knowledge and expertise as far as patent, and particularly patents of US is concerned, is a master really. Welcome, Mario Golab. We are also speaker from South Korea. It is, I, I always call South Korea as a technical country. I visited many times South Korea. People are really very versatile. They are expert in research rather. So I welcome Mr. Young Jun Kwon. Also, I would like to welcome Mr. Dilip Sharma, who is an assistant professor. Uh, Dilip Bhai, welcome to this webinar again and again. And we enjoy your uh, presentation always. I also welcome the entire audience who are from the different part of the world. And I also welcome our co-organizers. They are from different fields, but connected with the patents and industries and academia. So I welcome all of you and let us start our session. Over to Jalashree. Thank you so much, sir. It is under the guidance of Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya that HK Acharya and Company is now a team of highly qualified and expert visionaries. Now, this webinar will have a series of sessions which gives a flavor of remarkable diversity in the subject matter of IPR, patenting, biotech, and biomedical research. So before moving forward, I request everyone to kindly mute their audio. So, it's my privilege to introduce you all our honorable chief guest, Mr. Sudhir Vaid. Mr. Sudhir Vaid, by profession, a biotechnologist, is a technocrat turned entrepreneur. He has around 43 years of experience in the development of biopharmaceutical products, production management, marketing, and strategic planning. His last job assignment was in director biotechnology with Rand Baxi Laboratories, where he initiated and successfully completed biotechnology greenfield projects. During his 43 years of career, he has been associated with the most of the companies which intended to tag biotechnology as a greenfield project. He gained good experience by setting up such greenfield projects and with the rich experience and his risk-taking capabilities motivated him to start his own business. He started Concord at Dolka in Gujarat in the year 2000 in the month of May as its chairman and managing director and transformed this into biotechnology facility from a chemical strain and named this facility as a Concord Biotech Limited, which also got US FDA approval in 2005 and it became the first US FDA approved biotechnology facility of Gujarat. Now, Concord has become vertically integrated biotechnology company having its US FDA approved formulation facility at Valthera in Ahmedabad and API facility at Dolka. Concord has also regulatory approvals, which makes this company to sell its products all globally. So now I request him to present his thoughts with us. Thank you, Rashi, and uh, special thanks to Dr. Acharya for uh, uh, inviting me as a chief guest. And uh, I am very delighted to be a part of this uh, 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 dignitaries who are specialized in the IPR. And uh, basically, uh, I, I'm uh, personally, I feel very happy that being a biotechnologist, I am a part of this uh, webinar because 
because uh, it is going to be very informative and very educative for especially a person like me and the people who are uh, in the biotechnology area. Uh, I very well remember that in uh, uh, during 1970s, when uh, the patent act was changed and uh, this product patent uh, was uh, 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 not there. So at that time, really the industry, biotechnology industry and the pharma industry in India grew very well. Because during that time, you know, the pricing of our uh, medical, the pharmaceuticals and the drugs, it was very high. It was very, very high. So after uh, this 1970, when this product patent was not there, so really the Indian companies have grown very much during that time. So that was the time. And during uh, uh, almost after in the mid 1970s, I think or around 1995, India became a very cheap source for the APIs. So that was the time, but after 95, and uh, then product patent was uh, again implemented when we became a part of the you know, uh, WTO and TRIP. So at that time, again, this uh, basically, the product patent came into uh, limelight. But uh, I'm very happy that at least in biotechnology, uh, you people are the expert, uh, uh, we were very happy that at least uh, the stress which are a part of the uh, uh, biotechnology process, at least they were not uh, patented. They were not uh, because they are the natural product, so they were not uh, uh, patented. And uh, only it was that GMO strains, uh, genetically modified strains, that can be patented. Uh, I, I would like to hear more on... Uh, from you people, you are experts uh, about these uh, strains, which are uh, naturally available, and basically, which are GMO strains. Uh, how how the, this uh, GMO strain uh, means people can uh, circumvent, how this uh, natural strain and GMO strains difference can be there, because we are into this field, and uh, our aim is always, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, when the product patent expires, how we can immediately go into the market along with our uh, uh, process. So I have seen the most of the people, uh, the biotechnology areas, uh, when the product patent expires, we try to do the strain, but there are uh, in the downstream processing only, we feel that uh, major uh, area uh, people have challenges is the downstream processing polymorphs and uh, uh, in the particle size or impurity profiling. So people try to, you know, put more restrictions during uh, when the patent expires. There are again process patents are there which are in the DSP area. I have seen number of companies which only file patents just to restrict the other companies. So I will uh, be very happy if uh, the experts, they can put more light if it is uh, possible, how the downstream processing, because just restricting the people into not to in, enter into the market, such type of things, how we, it can be avoided. Secondly, I will, uh, when the protect, uh, also like to ask more questions on the, uh, product patent because in India, uh, basically the people are more into the uh, process patent rather than going into the NCE. Because in India, uh, you know, uh, NCE, if you see the, uh, the new chemical entities, it is very less as compared to the uh, process patent. Most of the people, they try to file uh, the patent on the process rather on the new chemical entities. So, Process patent is a basically a very important, uh, you know, part of our uh, Indian industry, uh, rather than the new chemical uh, uh, entities. So, the uh, the NCE is a separate, but for the product patent or the uh, process patent, there are lot of uh, restrictions are there due to all these, uh, you know. 
particle size and impurity profiling and all that. So that part, if you people can cover, that will be uh, quite interesting. So you people are more expert. I am here to listen more from you people rather than uh, talking myself. Uh, Concord has, of course, uh, uh, filed uh, six, seven uh, process patents. Basically, on the uh, process side, we have uh, see our aim is always to uh, file, uh, go into the market with Para 4. So which we try normally try to do all these things. So we have been successful. So Concord, I will just tell you what exactly we are doing. We are basically into the biopharmaceuticals and uh, it is the only company which is making uh, 30 biopharmaceuticals uh, uh, in our facility, which I don't think any company in the world, they do it. Making 30, uh, most 30 uh, biopharmaceuticals uh, through biotechnology routes. We are the leader in uh, immunosuppressants, antibiotics, then uh, antifungals, uh, oncology products. So we try to, uh, you know, file our uh, patents when uh, uh, to as a with a partner for filing para for uh, 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 partners. So we have successfully done the para for filings for our four or five products, and we have been very successful. Uh, Really, uh, you know, selling our products in the U.S. So definitely, I am uh, looking forward to hear from you people, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I am sure this is going to be a very educative for uh, the biotechnology people, and especially because it is a very very important thing because uh, due to certain uh, restrictions in the process. It is very difficult to then market our products. So looking forward to hear from you uh, uh, about this uh, biotechnology. Again, thanks, Dr. Acharya, for inviting me. Thank you. We are honored by your esteemed presence here. And we thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time for us. So now let me introduce our mentor, Mr. Padmin Boj. Our mentor is a comprises of three E's, expertise, experience, and enthusiasm. With the due presence of such a brilliant mentor, he helps to create a smooth path with his skill and abilities that link between delegate observers and listeners. Mr. Padmin Booch is a national level IPR domain expert and presently a senior visiting faculty with Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India. He is also a project and management advisor. He holds about 30 years of combined experience of intellectual property rights, corporate industry, project management, entrepreneurship development, and academics. Mr. Booch, as the managing director of JITCO, established a patent cell at JITCO. He received a GTO pedagogical award for the contribution in the IPR in the year 2013 and recently in the year 2018 he was conferred with the prestigious IP Samiratan of the year 2018 award by IPPO. He has been also invited as a national and international conferences and seminar on IPR. On official work and assignment he has visited widely across the globe. He has also completed BFARM, MBA, CMC, PG Diploma in Patent Law from Nasser University, Hyderabad. So now I request him to share his views with us. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Jarasri. And uh, greetings to everyone, as Dr. Rajesh Bhai say. Uh, whatever part of the world and whatever part of the day, uh, let's have a good time to all of you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for kind introduction. I always feel a little bit awkward when I am being introduced because of two reasons. Because the speakers, the galaxy of speakers are so much learned uh, that uh, my introduction doesn't uh, look right. Secondly, I am also part of the a kind of family of HK Achar and company and Mark Patton. So again, a formal introduction uh, looks a bit awkward. That is for myself. But it always feels good if somebody speaks good about us. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Vaid, uh, we uh, know him. We know his company very well. And because uh, Gujarat, India in general and Gujarat specific, uh, for some reason or other, has not been able to do that well in the field of biotechnology. While Gujarat is uh, a pharma capital kind of thing, uh, almost producing 35 to 40 percent of the pharma of India, biotechnology is somehow or other 
we could do much more. I, I think people should take inspiration from Concord and Mr. Sudhirvi. Things are happening, but it could have been better also. So we, Mr. Vaidya, uh, Sudhirji, we really admire you. Uh, you are one of the pioneers of this. Look, uh, I also admire Dr. Rajesh Bhai. He said in pandemic, uh, he, he has been holding webinars. See the kind of webinars is being organized by Markman. Entire spectrum of IPR. Nothing is left. In fact, he is going to come up with more and more, I'm sure. He has a lot of things up his sleeve, uh, a lot of assets up his sleeve. And we are happy, we are fortunate to be part of his interviews. So I must compliment that. Biomedical, particular biotechnology is one area which somehow or other remains a little bit grave for most of the people, particularly when we talk about IPR and PEP. As we know very well, anything which is natural cannot be patented straight away. Okay, it may be plant or it may be a microbe or microorganism. So that is the first thing which comes into the mind and what comes to the when we talk about patenting of biotechnology based products or biotech product or biological products, so to say. Biotechnology, if you really see, it is a much advanced field by now. Genetic engineering uh, technology, methods of isolation, methods of mutation, and the development of monoclonal antibodies, which is the latest thing in the, in the, in the era of pandemic. The MAB, as we call it, or a monoclonal antibody, has really now come into the forefront. We utilize a lot of repurposed drugs, but now the real drugs have come in a way. All the monoclonal antibodies based drugs are proving to be very effective. They may be a cocktail kind of combination or they may be pure. Now, these are the biotech products. And that is the question of what can be patented, what cannot be patented, what is ethical, what is not ethical. The moment we talk about biotechnological products, the question of ethics comes because we cannot tamper with the nature. We cannot go and try to patent something which you is a purely natural product. You have to go a long way. You have to go it with a, with a way just told. Product patent. Yes, product patent is required. We do process patent. Process patents are required. But product patent is required. For that, we need to work hard. And that is where the research comes, which is also part of the title of this webinar. Why can't we do, or why the whether we should do what always mention, a targeted research. Go backward. Find out what market needs. Find out what is patentable. Then start researching. Yes, research is not a machine based. There are going to be errors. There are going to be time lags. There are going to be trial and errors. But still, what is called targeted research is so much required in pharmaceuticals in general and biotech and biomedical in particular. Let's know what is required. Let's know what can be patented or what can it be. For example, the Indian Patent Act, Section 3C, lets out very clearly what cannot be patented as far as biotech patents are concerned. That is possible to do. But unfortunately, sometimes I have been visiting academic institutions also. Sometimes they don't have idea about it. I tell them that look to that. What can it be patentable? Section 3C is there, of course. There are Section 3J, 3I. They also list out uh, various products and uh, things which cannot be patented. So ethical issue has to be taken care. Ethical because we are tempering sometimes with the microbes and microorganisms. That is why ethics come. Like human embryotic cell, transgenic mouse. Now, these are the examples which has happened in past and there has been a lot of debate. There also various countries have somewhat differing kind of criteria. But I would say more or less 70-80% criteria are the same. Yes, then it brings to me uh, the one thing which I would have to mention about the potential. I so far I talk about what cannot be done. So if something cannot be done, we have to find out what can be done. Okay, that's simple as that. And that is the way for going for patent as a number we don't want. We want to do a patent because we will be coming out with a good discovery. And that is why we should know what can be patented, how far we can go, how much modification, structural modification we have to do. It should be man-made, not a nature-made. 
and that is where the huge potential of biosimilar comes into picture my dear friend if you don't know biosimilar is just another version of generic drugs just in pharmaceutical generic drugs are the those products where patent is expired and one can go for it the biotech products once the patents expire you go for it that are called biosimilar an estimated 400 us dollar 400 million us dollar is the potential of biosimilar products by 2025 and this is a conservative estimate my dear friend biosimilar is a segment we all need to look at close closely and that is where the collaboration among the academia the research and of course the ipr itself comes to the picture industry academia and research institutes have to come together to exploit to take advantage of the biosimilar potential which is there for us to tap so this is my message is do a target research find out what can be patented also find out what can be patented i have got a list of patentable innovations in biotech which i am ready to share and uh, of course all of you know about it so go for target research make it happen finally biomedical now this is something different little bit different biomedical is essentially utilization of the biotechnology in the field of healthcare so to say whether it is a different kind of equipments a syringes for example pre pre fill syringe pre fill syringe is not a new thing but it is one of the innovation which is a kind of biomedical innovation and that's so much required it facilitates it makes the delivery of the drug easier it makes the diagnosis of the disease easier that is biomedical field again having a huge potential i am i am a director on the board of troika pharmaceutical and years back uh, troika pharmaceutical pharmaceutical we came out with a ndds new drug delivery system of a diclofenac uh, injection called dynapar run and we introduce pre fill syringe 1 ml 1 ml dynapar injection based on diclofenac pre fill syringe that was we are earlier that time we are we can also design registration in this biomedical or not only patent we can have also registration of the design part of it so biomedical field is another field overall the opportunity is waiting for us what is need to be is the first never temper with the ethical part never ever never ever temper i am very clear about it there are enough number of ever news and ways and methodologies without tempering the nature we can come out with the newer versions of biotech products or biomed products let's go for it and i'm sure that today's webinar is going to throw up so many such ideas and suggestions and not only all of them not only me but we all are looking forward to uh, the learned discourses of the galaxy of the speakers which are available today once again i would like to thank uh, dr rajesh bhai and mark patton and everyone for giving me an opportunity to be part of this important webinar all the best i am here only of course by the way thank you thank you very much sir for an excellent speech so now moving forward let me introduce our next speaker mr richard milkyor mr richard milkyor is a professional with an experience of more than 40 years in it it and economic regulations including competition law he advises clients on ip strategy at national europe and worldwide he advises manages and argue complex litigation involving patent trademark and other kind of ip rights and also unfair competition issues he also handles trademark opposition at both level eu eu ipo and also in france a part of his work is also contractual and transactional and this is of the enforcement of the ip strategy decided with the client he advises are also guided by his knowledge of other economic regulation and can therefore include not only pure trademark cases but foresee the consequences of both in the legal areas and 
also from the commercial or marketing point of view even if he knows to litigate lots of their cases are settled and even if they do not go for the mediation he uses the fact that he is a qualified mediator to solve the issues outside the court so now i request mr milkyar to present his knowledge with us over to you sir namaste thank you to the organizer and uh, to dr asharya and he hello to mr bush uh, so unfortunately we are not physically together but i am happy to be there i have to apologize because uh, i will have to leave after i have a plane to catch and as dr asharya was saying i will share my experience and my experience is that you can always learn so therefore uh, that's the most important thing you have to stay open minded and concerning the topic of today some practical and legal point from a practical point of view we are speaking about a, we all know that a very technical area very specific area and one of the biggest issue when you are working in that field as a lawyer as i am uh, meaning that i do not draft patent i do not prosecute patents but i, I know how to destroy them uh, one of the difficult point is to find a good patent attorney able to uh, assist you and your client in uh, the area of uh, biotechnology uh, biomedical research i will say it's easy to find someone who deals with mechanic with chemical with telecommunication when you come to biotech uh, the pool of uh, talented patent attorney is much smaller second point you need uh, if you are uh, working in the international world you need to find someone who not only knows how to draft and prosecute a patent but to know who, who, who knows the specificities of the other countries because obviously you start from one country one region and you want to extend your uh, patent everywhere not everywhere meaning obviously not all the, all the members of the un but in lots of uh, countries where you want to sell your products or your services and uh, once again it's difficult to find the right uh, the good professional uh, i'm i'm speaking obviously from a french point of view but i think that it is true in several countries uh so the second the second point i would like to mention is that uh, before starting to patent you have research and uh which creates a problem which has to be solved carefully uh, because we are in a world where the research is done by universities uh, labs uh private labs public labs uh but very often in cooperation uh, or by a consortium or whatever you want to call it but it means that you need to have an agreement to define uh, who does what when how uh, and uh, this agreement should also mention clearly who will be in charge of uh, the prosecution who will be the owner or owners of the patent or patents to come and uh, sometimes uh, it is a topic which is not always uh, included in the agreement or which is not understood especially when you have a startup because everywhere in the world we have startups up and uh, you have some very talented young people who wants to change the world and that's a good thing but uh, in fact they have no idea about what they are doing and they are uh, facing uh, older people who are uh, including some clauses in the agreement saying everything is be done is, be, is going to be done by you everything is going to be owned by me uh, i mean obviously it's a, a little bit uh, uh, summary of uh, what happens but that happens uh, so therefore uh, I, I, that's some pr practical tips you have to remember 
uh, according obviously uh, uh, about you um, or taking into consideration your, your position, whether you are a lab, whether you are a single inventor, uh, and a, a, a subspecificity which is uh, specific to France, but mm, it exists in other countries is sometimes you have to be careful because the inventor uh, may uh, even uh, whether uh, this person is a, a salaried person or uh, working for the state or a part of the state, um, the, the inventor is allowed to receive some money uh, in relation with the invention that he made, uh, even if obviously he is not or he will not be the owner of the invention. And uh, you sometimes it, it is something which is not very well understood understood by uh, people where they are dealing with uh, French companies. But that's uh, obviously a specificity in relation with France. Now, what I'm going to speak about is in relation with uh, both the European Patent Convention, which uh, created the European Patent Office, and the EU, the European Union. As you may know, uh, the countries member of the EPO are uh, not the same than the one uh, which compose the EU. The EPO is not part of the EU. It's a, a different international organization, uh, even if both are located inside Europe. And uh, when you deal with biotech, you have to take into consideration two set of rules. The first one is the EPC, the European Patent Convention, and the second one is the uh, EU Directive concerning Biotechnology, Directive 9844. And a very important point, which was uh, differently uh, touched by Mr. Push, uh, is the fact that not everything is patentable uh, when we deal with uh, biotech. And uh, the EP, uh, EPC um, very clearly exclude from patentability a certain number of uh, things or areas uh, which concerns, for instance, uh, surgery, therapy, therapy, and diagnostic methods. And uh, one of the issue you may have if you file a patent, if you prepare a patent, which is going to be uh, either filed directly uh, as a European patent or extended to the uh, uh, to Europe, is uh, to make sure that your patent doesn't fall under one of the exception. And obviously, you have to remember that when we speak about biotechnology, we speak about something which can concern the human, but also, as it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Vaid, the plant or uh, the animals. Um, and therefore, you have to be careful. Uh, and uh, for instance, the, the rule 28.1 of the EPC states that you cannot um, patent uh, processes for cloning human beings processes for modifying the germline genetic identity of human being, use of human embryos for industrial or commercial purposes. And I'm not going to go through all the exceptions and to explain all the exceptions, but you have to remember that there are exceptions which concern either the human being or plant protection and uh, or the animals, and you also have to remember, but that's specific, that when you speak about plant, uh, if you cannot obtain a protection through a patent, maybe you can obtain a protection through a plant protection, um, since there is a specific plant protection right, at least, uh, which is governed by the UPOF convention, and uh, there is a specific EU uh, plant protection right, which uh, helps to protect the plant. So, so therefore, uh, you have to prepare your strategy uh, in order to find out if what you are going to patent is really uh, patentable or not. And 
that's the reason why I was mentioning that you need to find the good patent attorney uh, in order to be able also perhaps to modify a little bit your uh, the wording of your patent in order to go around the exception because the exceptions uh, are limited and you have exception to the exception in the EPC and maybe you if you write it in one way you will fall into the exception but if you change a little bit the scope of the protection uh, that you try to obtain if you change a little bit the description that's I will say the, the skill of the good patent attorney uh, maybe you will be able to um, obtain the protection which apparently sh should not be obtained or could not be obtained uh, so going into details is I will say too long and too complicated for a, a seminar like that uh, and but that's really the first um, information I wanted to uh, convey to you, which is the fact that you need to uh, think uh, carefully before uh, starting uh, to uh, to file your patent. And uh, for instance, if you file directly from India. Uh, maybe uh, you will have a patent attorney who, who will uh, obviously draft something which will be acceptable by the Indian office. But uh, if you want to extend your uh, market to the European countries, uh, maybe you will discover that the limitation in India are different than the limitation in the uh, uh, included in the European Patent Convention. And uh, therefore, it's better to, uh, to try to cover uh, both type of limitation at the time of drafting, instead of having to fight a huge battle with the examiner in whatever office. And we all know that fighting with the examiner takes a lot of time uh, and also a lot of money uh, that maybe you can avoid by spending one or two additional weeks of uh, thinking ahead. Uh, now, as I told you, uh, we have two sets of rules which have to be taken into consideration. The first one that I just mentioned is the one of the EPC, and the second one is the one coming from the uh, EU Directive on Biotechnology. Uh, even if both set of organization and both set of flows are different and are not linked, uh, it happens that uh, the uh, chambers from the uh, EPO are taking into consideration uh, the case law of the European Court of Justice, uh, and they mentioned sometime in their decision uh, that the uh, case law from the Court of Justice of the European Union is not binding on them, but is ne nevertheless pervasive. So therefore, uh, even if it's not legally binding, the uh, decision from the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union are taken into consideration by the EPO in order to uh, avoid to create a drift uh, between the, the two types of organization. Now, what do we have in uh, the EU directive? Um, the, the directive allows bio, to protect bio, biotechnological invention under national patent law, even if they concern a product consisting of biological material or process to produce or use them. However, you cannot patent, that's article four of the directive, plant or an animal varieties, and you cannot patent essentially biological process for the production of, of plants of animals or animals. Nevertheless, there is once again a limit to the limit and um, invention which concerns plants or animals shall be patentable if the technical feasibility of the invention is not confined 
to a particular plant or animal vari variety. And the uh, limitation uh, just mentioned before shall be without prejudice to the patentability of invention which concern a microbiological or other technical process or a product obtained by means of, a, of such a process. So therefore, once again, you have to be careful in your drafting. You, I have to mention now Article 5. Article 5 uh, creates limitation to the patentability of the human body, but not to parts of some parts of the human body. This, this means, for instance, that protecting or patenting a, ge a gene is doable. And Article 6 is a very important um, article because I will say it's the ethical article. Uh, Mr. Bush was speaking about ethics before, uh, and it is similar to the article I mentioned, uh, to, or to the rule I mentioned uh, in the EPC. Uh, you cannot uh, patent processes for cloning human beings, for modifying the germline genetic identity, and so on and so forth. We have the same limitation in the uh, biotechnology directives and the one in the EPC. Uh, so at the end, uh, does that mean that you cannot patent anything uh, in relation with biotech? Obviously not. You can patent uh, some biotechnological invention, uh, but you have to be careful. And uh, you also have uh, to understand, at least I'm speaking about uh, the EPO, uh, the fact that sometime, and right now I'm facing this, uh, this for one of my clients, you are facing examiner who are not able to understand what you are speaking about because the technology is so new that, uh, and let's say defeats all everything which has been done before. That's, uh, when, you, that's when you have uh, really an invention which, is, uh, which creates a disruption uh, that they don't even understand what you are speaking about because it's not supposed to work. And according to my client, I'm not able obviously to, to say because I don't have this uh, technological background. According to my client, yes, it works. But if, even if it works now, our problem is that we have to convince the examiner that he just have to think outside of the box and uh, understand that, yes, you can walk on your head, even if it's not uh, the usual way to walk. <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, I, with that, uh, I, I will, as I said before, we can learn every day, both from the evolution of the law and from the uh, cases or situation we have to handle. And uh, it is not easy to, or it is less easy to patent uh, products or process in the area we are speking about today than in other, let's say, more usual uh, activities such as, such as mechanics, optics, or whatever. But uh, yes, it is, it is doable. You have some uh, limitation. You can overcome the limitation. Uh, but once again, uh, you need to be flexible and you need to find the uh, correct person to assist you, uh, which means primarily, I will say, uh, the good patent attorney. For me, a big, uh, the biggest, um, let's say, uh, lesson I can share with you today is that uh, if you don't have the correct person to help you, uh, you will not go very far. Thank you for your attention. I hope that uh, I mean you could learn something from my uh, presentation. And I'm sorry, I will have to leave you, but uh, I hope that uh, you will learn much more during the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with your thoughts. So let me introduce our next speaker for this session, Dr. Mario Sergio Gola.
He was born in Argentina and graduated in 1973 as an aircraft technician and helped to build the first composite glider in Latin America. The same year, he holds his bachelor's degree. In 1974, Dr. Gola moved to Israel and graduated as an aeronautical engineer at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. In early 1980s, he moved to the USA and worked at NASA. In 1987, Dr. Mario received his master's degree in international management management from Thunderbird and then worked as the director for Latin America for Seagate Technology and later as a vice president at Recall.com. After gaining experience at the top U.S. law firm, Dr. Mario founded Golab Intellectual Property to offer his combined 40 years experience and expertise in engineering, international business, management and law. He has been frequently called by, to a lecturer by the World Intellectual Property Organization before various universities and governments and by other organizations. Dr. Golab is a registered patent attorney before USPTO and is admitted to litigate at the highest courts of Florida and also in the USA. In, he is a member of the Florida Bar and various IP associations and he enjoys arts, traveling and speaks seven languages fluently. So with my utmost pleasure. I request him to share his views with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to those uh, in America. Good afternoon to those in Europe. Good evening to those in Asia. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Dr. Asharya, for um, always considering me to the organizers, Mark Patton and Omkar Acharya. as a real privilege to, um, to, to be here. Um, I want to start by doing a little bit of introduction and what is biotech and um, the value of biotech and, 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 and biomedical research. Um, uh, traditionally, the, the betterment of the world came from some mechanical inventions, electronic inventions, and that had to do with human comfort and created lots of wealth for those who, who research and, and, and develop and produce products. But biomedical research, biotech in general, affects human life. And that is, uh, a brings a, a different set of ethics to the question of, of patenting um, biotechnology. And to understand, there's three uh, distinct uh, interest groups. Is the, there's the, the, the research group uh, that uh, has to do mostly with the universities and, and research companies, uh, the manufacturers who actually um, are, are interested in, in getting a, a bioequivalent or, or, or the drug to be able to manufacture or the technology, and then there's the consumer. Uh, the, the interests are adverse, but they are the same. Uh, on one hand, the research requires tremendously expensive equipment and extremely talented human beings that have spent years, probably a lifetime, developing knowledge and trying to advance this knowledge. We have seen this with the COVID-19, with the mRNA vaccines, that this, we have a researcher that has been working on it for 30 years and against the, the traffic, against everything. So, um, and it took 30 years and the amount of money that Pfizer and BioNTech and uh, governments uh, had in order to develop a drug. Of course, there are the drugs in the world, but I'm just talking about one of the technologies. On the other side, the manufacturer um, that, who requires the equipment, but doesn't require so much the, the, the human, of course, they, they, they do have uh, the human capacity to develop, but it is more on, on obtaining a product. And finally, there's a consumer who just is interested in paying the least amount for the most amount of benefit. And is really does, he understands, yeah, that it takes some money to develop that, but that doesn't understand the mechanics of it. In the middle of all this, we created an incentive called intellectual property rights to uh, societies created this incentive. So the developers will have, uh, the research will obtain uh, some type of protection and some type of reward. And that reward would be substantial enough incentive that would bring the very best. We believe in uh, that that reward is not an ideological reward, but it is economical reward. Uh, it hasn't worked very well with the ideological reward, but it did work very well with the fi with financial reward. 
Today, most of the research in biotech is done in, in, uh, in Europe, prim primarily in Switzerland, Germany, France, and other countries in the periphery like Israel and, and the United States. And of course, in the Asia, we have uh, Japan and Korea that there, there's a lot of research going on. So we're talking about the cost of research. How do you actually um, support this cost? I mean, the costs are tremendous. And for those who invest in, an, an, in a proposal and an idea, it's not obvious that there's a result there. It's not obvious that something that may look absurd, absurd at the very beginning may end up being something that has revolutionized the world and perhaps get a Nobel Prize for the developers. Um, that's, a, that's a very risky amount of money. And in many cases, governments or government entities are, are the ones who, who support this thing it's because society would, in general, would benefit. We understand that, but it's difficult. I think it was mentioned by Richard Melchior to even for the examiners to understand what a technology is, what the idea is, let alone approve it and figure out what's going on. Um, so, uh, having uh, given this introduction, and uh, it's a balanced act what the different parties have to do. I'm going to review right now what's the situation with uh, protecting intellectual prop obtaining intellectual property, particularly patents, in the United States. So if you give me a second, I will share my screen. Okay. I hope everybody can see that. So I'm going to start with a further delay. Um, about me, you know who I am. Um, I'm a patent attorney. So uh, basically, okay, let's see if we can do that. Let's see, for some reason it's not responding. Okay. To understand the, um, the basis of it, we're looking at 1787. That's two years before the French Revolution. Just imagine the mind thought of people in the uh, 17th century. It is mind boggling that somebody could think that patents or intellectual property will have some value, but it is in the core of the US constitution where it provides in uh, article one, section eight, that to promote the science, we will give uh, rights, temporary rights to inventors and writers. So even then we thought that it would be um, an incentive to develop the economy and to provide a betterment for the world to have patents, trademarks and copyright. Now let's go straight to the patent requirements that are pretty much similar in all, all over the world. And uh, it's whoever invents or discover a new useful process, machine manufacturer or composition will get, uh, will obtain protection through a patent. The invention has pretty much only three requirements and look very simple. It must be new, worldwide novelty. That is, means that through literature or disclosure to other patent agents or some other publication, that product has to be new. However, in the United States, we have a disclosure that could be happening up to a year before the application of a patent, and still you can get the patent. Now, that disclosure will void uh, applications uh, in, in most Europe and Latin America and other countries. So there is, uh, that is a caveat. Now, in the United States, we have something called a provisional patent. In the provisional patent, what it helps is that you can file it up to a year before a regular patent. And in that provisional patent, you really put everything you have. And then from that universe, you derive the non-provisional or regular patent. So that is something that uh, could be uh, used in order to avoid um, uh, the, the exhaustion of novelty in other countries of the world. The second thing has to be non-obvious. That means uh, if you have a car and you paint it black like Ford Warner and you have a new car painted in a different color, well, that, um, that is obvious that you can paint in any color with the exception that if you paint it white, maybe you, and with some reflective paint, you can claim that that car would be cooler and would have a self-air conditioner. 
that would be a non-obvious type of feature by having white paint. Okay, so inventive step on the non-obviousness is very important, but this is pretty much everywhere. And in the third uh, prong is that it must be useful. It has to have some utility, it cannot be an abstract thought. Now, so we have um, four categories that uh, they're included. The process, that's the way you do something. So for example, a manufacturer in India that actually manufactures a drug, it has a process and that process itself, how it does the product, that process could be patented. The machine, the machine is actual machine that actually makes the, makes the, the product. And the manufacturer is the product itself. So if you, uh, you can patent the product itself or you can practice, pass it, patent the process. And finally, with, for most research, what's important is the composition of matter. Okay, now, so, so, since we know what's patentable, we need to know what is not patentable. Number one, to, we need to understand that a, a patent is just one, and when you're talking about biotech and medical research, patents are, or, or, or copyright or whatever other protection is just one prong of protection. You will require uh, approval of many government organizations like the Food and Drug Administration in the US and in different countries, you have different uh, organizations that are similar, the equivalent that will have to approve that something is, uh, it could be put in, into the public. So what's not patentable in the US? Loss of nature and physical phenomena. Why is that? Because we don't know who's the inventor, very simple. If you are religious, you know who the inventor is, but you cannot get them to sign the oath of, of inventorship. So if you cannot sign, we don't have an inventor. For those who don't, are not religious, it's very simple. We don't know who the inventor is. So the, in both cases, it's the same. So both laws of nature and physical phenomena are not. And abstract ideas. We need ideas to be practical, to be useful, to have some use for another human being. Now, I want to spend a, a few minutes about discovery versus invention. Uh, invention is the product of a creative mind. A discovery is something that you stumble upon and it may or may not have some use. You can assign some use or figure out, wow, with this type of situation of this type of object or this type of product, I can do this, this and that. Well, then you discover something, but then you find the use for it. But the discovery by itself, it's meaningless. Actually think about it, when I was growing up, they say, oh, Columbus discovered America. Well, that's from the European centric point of view. But if you look from the American centric point of view, we discover Columbus or we discover the Europeans. Anyway, we like it, I think an encounter is better. So discovering something is not, it's not subject to being patented. It has to be an invention. Now, what's generally not patentable? We mentioned discoveries in that sense, the discovery that has no useful application, okay? The, the theories itself and the mathematical methods. Now, let's talk about for a second about mathematical methods, even though it's not biotech, but there's some bio research uh, in, in this. Let's say you have an algorithm to discover the, the rate of the fracture of the retina of an eye, and you can use that algorithm to program a machine to use, send a laser to cauterize and to seal uh, the retina as it's, as it's spreading. So while the algorithm itself will not be patented, will not be patented, the, um, uh, the machine that we use, yes, or the process of, make, of, of, of doing it, the medical process will not be patented, but the process of the machine will be patentable. Aesthetic creations. Now, non utility anything that is of beauty, we know that we protect to copyright. However, some of those things could be, have some utilitarian uh, use. And therefore we have a type of patents called a design patent or utility model in Europe. Uh, schemes, rules, methods of performing mental acts or playing games. All those things are uh, works of the mind and we don't have a protection for that. And uh, how you arrange or present information. Finally, what's uh, relevant to us, to this talk to us, the surgical procedures, therapeutic treatments or diagnosis. The reason we don't have patents for that are because we have an interest that the, the, when something is developed, a procedure, a treatment, that, that knowledge of treatment be shared by the whole humanity. 
and there, there's an interest that is uh, pretty much life depends on it. So when we develop something like that, that's the reason we don't have a patent on that. In 1980, the world changed, at least for the United States in everything. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that anything under the sun made by man is patentable. Now, how we people read this is, wow, look at this. Anything under the sun is patentable. Well, the emphasis should be in made by man. Yes, anything made by men. So uh, it, that is the, that's the effect of it. And that, is, that was in a case by uh, Cindy Diamond, which is the commissioner for patents for the USPTO versus uh, Ananda Chakravarti, a West Bengali uh, American scientist who developed um, uh, uh, <clears throat> bacteria that ate uh, oil. We're, I want to uh, spend a few a, a minute or two in, in what happened with Chakravarti. The case is very important because it was a before and after. Um, the, Ananda Chakravarti invented uh, he, uh, genetically, he was an engineer at General Electric, and he invented a, a genetically engineered bacterium that it's used to eat oil. So you have this oil spills in the middle of the ocean. We throw this bacteria and they will eat that. If somebody has a septic tank, we'll throw this bacteria there and we'll eat everything. And the byproduct will be uh, just an organic um, disposal, disposable product. And um, so that's a tremendously great invention. What happened is the USPTO said, well, that's a living thing, a bacteria. So that's therefore not patentable. And you, the, both the examiner and the internal court of the USPTO rejected the application. It went to the Court of Appeals for patents and uh, it reversed that because here it is, the sole fact of the, that microorganism is alive is without legal significance. Being alive is not significant. We have to know what type of life. Is this a, a life that can, is capable of reproducing itself? In that case, it's a living thing and it will not be patentable. If it's not capable of reproducing itself, it will be patentable. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, we know the Scottus, uh, says that uh, any new and, new and useful composition of matter would be patentable, and it came with this, uh, this idea. In this case, the bacteria is a non-natural phenomenon. It was made in the laboratory. It's a composition of matter manufactured. Now, what happened? Uh, the no patent being issued a claim directed to composite in human error. That is a, that's a threshold that is, um, uh, was implemented in the law in the 2011. It always existed. It didn't, it's not something that did not exist before. It just, it was implemented in the law of the American Invent Act. Um, now, oh, until recently we have natural scientists and uh, natural uh, 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 substances that such as adrenaline and insulin, they were patentable, patented. And because what they did is they, they isolated, the researchers isolated the, the component that had the active reaction or, or caused the human or the, the reaction. And once the, the, the component was isolated, that component as it was manufactured, it was, uh, it was patentable. Uh, however, things have changed. In 2013, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the Mary Soleil just isolating was not sufficient. Now, one of the things that happened, and for many people living in, in, uh, in probably in countries that don't have so much protection, researchers were going to the Amazon, to the jungles of Borneo or Papua New Guinea, and were trying to figure out how the, the people there use um, uh, tribal medicine to, to cure themselves. And once they identify something very unique that it was effective, they tried to isolate it and protect it. And that's it. that is not sufficient. Uh, so the, the Supreme Court held that an isolated DNA molecule is patent ineligible if the sequence is the same as a natural occurring sequence. However, if a molecule whose sequence does not occur in nature, that's patent eligible. That means that opened the floodgates, of course, for all the research in genes and things like that, and all the modify, uh, genetic modifications that we, we have today. Now, in the last 25 years, uh, we have grown by leaps and bounds and what is patentable and how the, the biotech grew both as an industry 
and the research and the, pharmacolo the pharmacological effects that come associated with it. So we have the, the patent of the famous onco mouse that we mentioned before, that was very useful in studying cancer. Uh, in the uh, end of uh, last uh, century, we had, a, we had the first patent claiming that primate embryonic stem cells that were produced in a laboratory. And finally, in 2001, actually, we have a patent on human embryonic stem cells. Just to um, a comment, uh, while we have a restriction in human development and cloning, uh, that's not um, uh, happened with uh, animals. And uh, we have the famous case of Dolly last century. But uh, for example, in my uh, home country, Argentina, um, there's a, a polo is a, one of the major sports and the best polo player has an heirs where he grows, uh, grows uh, and develops cloning of horses. And he has his best horse and he has about eight clones of that horse who is for sale. So it's not uh, uh, research continues not in humans, but it, yes, continues in animals. Now, let's get to something that is very much specific to the biotech industry. Uh, a gene is um, uh, it's a pattern of a specific isolated gene sequence and its chemical compositions, the process for obtaining on a combination of such. We can claim that if this is a laboratory produced gene. Now, the, the gene pattern might claim the isolated natural sequence of genes um, the use of a natural sequence for purpose such as diagnostic testing or a natural sequence that has been altered by adding a promoter or other changes to make it more useful. This is the area where we're talking about that's the biggest area of research. Well, medicine is becoming more and more personalized. As, as we develop that, we'll be able to do identifiers of the gene sequence of humans, of a particular human, and be able to do a therapy to that. And research is being conducted right now on the data to even forecast how a person will develop certain um, uh, pathologies through his life, his or her life, and how science may actually um, uh, apply some cures way, way before this pathology developer show up in any exams. Uh, the, pat the, the gene patterns are granted in isolated gene sequences with known functions, there's very important known function. These patterns cannot be applied to the naturally occurring genes in humans or other naturally occurring organisms. Now, in the United States, uh, something happened in the 1980s, and this is the very important law, the bail Dole Act. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, funding for uh, research is extremely expensive, and mostly governments are the ones who do that. Uh, today, of course, companies associate with the, with the research institutions and contribute to that, but the contribution is minimal compared to the government. So in exchange for that, before the Baydol Act, the government of the United States retained all rights in the intellectual property. So while the, the research was developed, it was very, the incentive was not big for the institutions and the, and the research uh, universities to actually spend the, the, the millions that are required to, to have the labs to attract the, 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 the top talent for them to do the, 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 the research that was required. So the Bain Act provided uh, uh, a, a little twist and, and pretty much what it says is, the US government will retain a non-exclusive license to practice whatever intellectual property is developed from that research. The rest will belong to the university and to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the inventor. Now, what's the effect of that? $1.3 trillion uh, of economic growth and uh, 4.2 million jobs and 11 million startups. Okay, finally, I want to say, intellectual property has to be protected as a product of the mind and not only patents, copyright on the, on the text, which helps us develop and trademark on the products we do that. But as you see, the fourth one is uh, trade secret. And we ignore that, but trade secret is the most important because we start with trade secret and we keep trade secret as much as possible. I want to thank everyone. If you have any questions, um, and I'm available and thank you very much. Right. Namaste. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. It was a very insightful presentation. So now moving forward to our next speaker, Mr. Yu Jun Kwan. Mr. Kwan has completed his Master's of Law from Northwestern University School of Law and Master of Science in Chemical Engineering and Life Science from Yonsei University. He is an advisor of the Central Pharmaceutical Affairs Council of Korean Food and Drug Administration and also an advisor of Korean Government Trade Commission. He is a patent attorney assisting SMEs in their IPR protection at the Ministry of SMEs and startup of Korean government. He is also a Korean technology transfer agent at the Central Pharmaceutical Affairs Council, Korea. Mr. Kwan is a member of INTA, PTMG, ECTA, APPA, and KPAA, being the Attorneys Association. So now I request him to present his thoughts with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me. Um, may I share my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, okay. Okay, I'd like to uh, speak to you all um, about uh, how to, okay, oh. okay, how to uh, protect um, the, the pharmaceutical inventions in Korea. Um, this is uh, the outlook overview, uh, how to we the Korea to protect the pharmaceutical invention. So when uh, we uh, develop new compound, um, like a uh, synthesized, and we have a patent application, and then can be the patent registration rate if we uh, allowed for registration. And then we have a claim one, for example, for claim uh, compound A, and we have claim two for compound B. And also, it's very unique um, system uh, for pharmaceutical invention is that we needed to uh, obtain the marketing approval uh, from FDA before we sell the drugs, the produced by the patent. And then uh, we have uh, uh, for uh, us to have uh, the updated marketing approval. It takes a long time, like uh, several years generally. So there is a lot of time to work, enforce the patent uh, registration, even after the patent is registered. So there will be a system to make up the loss of time for marketing approval. So we called it the patent term extension. So that uh, can be, the patent can be extended uh, up to five years if we uh, spend time to marketing approval. And then um, the, the patent application registration and then the, the marketing approval system um, from FDA it can be connected, linked together to uh, give the, the patentee the more, the easier uh, enhanced file to enforce patent registration uh, after the generic shows up. So the patent registration, the patent linkage systems, and the patent term, they are all connected to protect the patent, uh, the, the uh, pharmaceutical invention in, uh, in Korea. And also, even though the patent, uh, the application patent registration include the claim for confound A itself, the patent protection uh, will be really be changed uh, after the original patent term of 20 years expired and then the, the extended patent term of five years is given. For example, we have a patent registration for compound A, but after the original patent term and then in the uh, time of the extended patent term five years, the patent protection will be narrowed, reduced, limited to some specific type of salt, which is that uh, object to um, marketing of hope in Korea. I will explain later a, a little bit uh, more. Uh, this is happening uh, many the medical use claim, medical use invention. That means that we uh, developed new uh, compound uh, for for the, the dealing, um, the preventing the uh, uh, curing the disease. And then we have uh, some medical indication for the compound we found, and we uh, make a claim. Uh, we, we can claim the so-called medical use claim. In Korea, the medical use claim will be drafted the pharmaceutical composition comprising the product X. The product X means like a compound uh, for treatment of disease, some specific disease. So this is a general term, uh, the, the medical use claim in Korea. And so such diagram, such outlook uh, can be happening um, for medical use claim in Korea, although the second medical use claim is protectable in India. And next, um, okay, the PTE, the patent term extension. So 
the as in other major jurisdiction in the, in the world, like US, Japan, Korea, China, maybe India too, uh, we have a PT system to make up the loss of time uh, for patentee, uh, the time or spend um, uh, for the marketing approval. But in the Korean law and practice, a uh, little bit conservative to uh, give the, the, the extended patent term uh, to patentee because the we the Korea is, uh, can be said uh, very strong at the uh, technology, but uh, still the Koreans the technology focusing on electronics and machines. But we are not so good at uh, developing new drugs, new chemical compounds. So Korean uh, practice and law really bit uh, don't like to extend the protection of the chemical or pharmaceutical compound. So. Uh, unlikely the US law, we don't have the PTE for cosmetics, food additives, and uh, we have some um, many um, limitation for PTE uh, to give the, the extend patent term um, five years to patentee. For example, uh, we have a new um, uh, uh, found new, uh, we have a developed a new compound, and then we uh, claim uh, pharmaceutical composition and comprising product X. Uh, for treatment this is why and we have uh, obtained the first marketing approval and then later we also developed a new uh, medical indication for the confound we developed so we can uh, file the application or we can make a new another claim for same composition same confound but different disease so that can, could be medical new second medical use claim so this is can be also obtained um, uh, marketing approval, second marketing approval. But in Korea, we only uh, um, the apply for the PTE patent term extension only for the first marketing marketing approval, this one. So even though we have uh, uh, developed new drugs um, for one single compound for many different uh, diseases, like a first medical use claim, second and third, first, we only can uh, apply for the PTE for first marketing approval, even though we have many other uh, uh, medical invention, medical invention uh, originate from one um, confound. So next page. So this is uh, the, 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 the outlines, the pattern ranking system in Korea. We uh, introduced uh, this system um, for the making, making deal with the United States FDA years ago, maybe 2012, I think. This is almost um, similar uh, structure of the United States Hatch-Waxman Act. So the main idea is that uh, the pattern, we have a pattern registration and we um, uh, record our pattern into the, uh, the FDA system, Korean FDA system. The patentee can have very easy injunction against um, the generic drug uh, manufacturer, for example. Um, we have a patent registration uh, rings uh, with the FDA system. Um, a generic shows up, they want to sell um, uh, similar drugs to the patented drug. Uh, the patentee just file complaint. And then that would be automatic injunction uh, to prevent a generic manufacturer to sell produce the drugs, even though it doesn't matter. The real, the the the, the, the generic, uh, they uh, infringe the patent or not. It doesn't matter. Just if the patent file are compliant to the generic uh, generic drug manufacturer, that will be uh, automatic um, the injunction uh, in favor of the patentee. However, otherwise, in other direction, in other view, um, the pat uh, the generic drug manufacturer, if they uh, succeed in invalidating and challenging the patent registration the original drug, they will be given nine months exclusive sales right. It's a very you know, big um, advantage for generic manufacturer to try to invalidate uh, patent of the original drug manufacturer because the it, after the patent, um, the, the new drugs uh, patent expired and there will be a rush uh, many, many, many uh, generic drug manufacturers, they want to sell market in, into the market uh, to sell the drug. But if the one um, general manufacturer, they will be given nine months uh, extra right to sell the drugs, their general drug, they can control the market after the patent, uh, the real patent expires. So 
So there are two ways. The pattern to can very easier injunction, but in other way, um, the general drug manufacturer, they will be given nine months exclusive right to sell into the, uh, uh, to get into the market if they succeed in validate, uh, invalidated the patent registration of, of new drug for the first time. So they are all connected. Uh, many systems of pattern, the pharmaceutical pattern systems all connected. So next page. I compared the two systems, United States and Korea, the pattern ranking system. Generally, we uh, uh, follow, uh, uh, follow the US system. Okay. And so um, um, we have a pattern registration, and then we have a marketing approval uh, for uh, market, uh, this sale produce um, the drug uh, produced by the pattern into the market. But the pattern claim um, um, can be drafted by a confound. For example, sulfanacin, this is kind of one, one of a, um, the new confound by uh, manufactured by the, um, the Japan age, uh, the famous uh, uh, pharma corporation Atalas. So that's like a unitary system uh, drugs. But the marketing approval should be um, the Salt form because the human body cannot receive the compound itself. The for uh, the compound to be administered into human body, they they should be converted a sort of the the salt here succinate. So the pattern claim reads solifenation compound, but marketing approval for the pattern is of a specific type of. Um, Salt here, sulfanacin succinate, and the after twenty years of patent term, the, this patent can be extended up to five years. But previously in Korea, people think our practice was that uh, for twenty years original patent term, the patent can cover any kind of the any kind of salt. Uh, from the solifanacin. For example, solifanacin, fumarate, solifanacin, succinate, they are all covered by protected by the patent. But after 20 years or pat pat uh, the patent term, um, even though the patent term extended, but during the extended patent term, the Korean court protected the patent only for some types of the specific uh, salt. Here, the solifanacin, succinate, which is uh, subject of the marketing approval of the patent. But several years ago, the Korean court um, changed their view to cover um, all kinds of salt, even after the, 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 uh, the patent term expired and then the patent um, uh, expanded, uh, the, 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 the protected during the, the expanded patent term. So nowadays we have a patent and the registration to, so after the 20 years patent term, in the we the, the patent is protected in the extended patent term, the all kinds of salt also protected by the patent, like um, United States and Europe, Japan, Korea, similar uh, regulation to um, um, read that the extended patent can be protected only for specific type of salt, which is object of the marketing approval. But Japan, they are practically ex uh, expand the protection into another kind of salt. And US and Europe, they have a law to cover any salt and various derivatives. So we, our system can be and become, became a little bit more similar to US and Europe. There is a big, big difference. So after the Supreme Court, many Korean generic corporation, they just give up to challenge, um, fight against original uh, drug manufacturer because even though they succeed and even though they change their sold, they all the changes sold can be um, blocked by the original patent. Okay, and next one. Very simple, the last page. Um, I, um, the title, Be Not a Move Maker and 
B inventor, meaning that we recently uh, have many of section, sometimes uh, citing YouTube, um, meaning that the inventor uh, invent, uh, drug, and confound, new confound. So new confound is almost impossible to be rejected because confound the, the differently many other, other technical field. Uh, confound is synthesized newly, uh, new confound is uh, very new, just, just almost created. So, but even though uh, the inventor um, disclosed the invention in the YouTube, and then the first application uh, was duly filed it, within grace period, uh, for example, one year in Korea or Europe, United States. So this uh, European application will be safe because they can be a claim for one year grace period for YouTube uh, publication. But after the European application or Indian or United States application, uh, we've File you file the Korean application with claiming um, the Paris Convention priority based on uh, European or American Indian application within one year, but the Korean application will lose the novelty if the Korean application was filed one year after the YouTube move, movie. So sometimes, if your client the disclose the invention YouTube, you need to very hard to file your application and the foreign application like in Korea. So I recommend our client and your clients be a movie maker just to be inventor. Thank you. This is all I prepared today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for discussing the topic in a very comprehensive way. So let's move forward to our next speaker, Mr. Dilip Sharma. He is an assistant professor at ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad, India, and is currently pursuing a PhD degree from Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad, India, in the field of artificial intelligence and IPR. Mr. Sharma has completed his postgraduate studies, LLM, in the IPR laws at the National Law University, Jodhpur, India. He has published and presented numerous papers on various topics related to IPR in several universities in India as well as in abroad. He is also editor of the two books recently published on intellectual property rights. Most recently, Mr. Sharma was conferred with the prestigious Young Asian IP Research Scholar Award at the 5th Asian IP Work in Progress Conference 2020. Mr. Sharma is a member of the IP and Innovation Researchers of Asia Network. So now I request him to present his views with us. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Chalashri, for the kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to uh, wish all the attendees and the participants who are participating in this particular webinar a very good evening and a very good morning to my friends who are on the other part of the world. And I would like to begin with thanking markpatent.org and more particularly to Rajesh Kumar Acharya, sir, for inviting me to be a part of uh, this particular session on intellectual property rights, uh, patenting, and biotech for biomedical research. I would like to congratulate him for picking this very particular topic because as we know that in the present time frame, the biotech industry, it is one of the fastest growing industry in the world. And uh, India is one of the significant contributor in this particular area. If we look into the present rankings in the terms of the biotechnological sector, India is among the top 12 countries who are contributing in the biotechnological inventions. And one of the important reason of the same is the rich biodiversity resources which we are having in our country, which is contributing us or which is allowing us to come out with various kinds of new uh, biotechnological inventions because of the availability of the raw materials and because of various other uh, favorable conditions or the factors which we have into our country. Uh, so if we look into the current trends, then India is contributing into various uh, sectors. Uh, if we look into the uh, biotechnological inventions across the globe, then they are more importantly into some of the significant fields like medicine in the areas of the food, fertilizers, energy, and in the areas like environment protection. And we know that India's pharmaceutical industry is one of the leading industry across the 
globe which is coming uh, which is committed towards the research and development into these particular areas more particularly in the drug development so if we'll grant the patent protection to these kind of biotechnological inventions so this will further support the biotechnological industries, the research towards these kind of industries for further developments. Uh, it will attract uh, collaborations from the foreign organizations. Uh, it will help them in getting more foreign di direct investments in, uh, it will help them in uh, entering into various forms of collaborative research. So uh, we can see that uh, while developing, if we talk about uh, development of a single drug, we know that it involves millions of dollars which are invested by a particular entity before inventing any particular drug. Let's take the example of our COVID vaccine. Billions of dollars were invested in uh, before uh, we invented a particular kind of COVID vaccine uh, for the people. And still we are in the phase of the development of these fine kind of vaccines. And still we are investing a lot of money into this particular area. So patent, uh, in a way, it grants the limited monopoly rights, statutory rights to the inventor. So it helps them in a way to recoup their research and development cost. So in that way, it is very beneficial part for the uh, patentee if uh, these kind of uh, protections will be granted to the uh, inventor. Now, if you look into the biotechnological sectors, these are more particularly divided into two parts. One, classical biotechnological, uh, sector and uh, second one we can probably name it as the modern biotechnological sector where in classical we can see the produ uh, production of the chemicals or the isolations of the antibiotics or maybe the microorganisms related inventions we can probably club it over there and if you look into the uh, modern biotechnological uh, inventions we can probably look into the genes uh, genetic engineering or antibodies, all these particular things, what we can see in the present time frame in uh, terms of the COVID vaccines and all these things. So all these are a part of the uh, modern biotechnological inventions which we are having. And as uh, told by my previous speakers, we can, uh, in terms of under the patent laws, more particularly now in India, uh, we have both the product and the process patent lien. And it was uh, very beautifully portrayed by uh, my co-panelist earlier uh, that when we ask a question to uh, us that whether biotechnological inventions are patentable uh, or not, then uh, he very beautifully quoted the case of uh, Diamond versus Chakravarti, where the Supreme uh, Court of the US stated that everything under the sun that is made or invented by mankind is uh, can be a subject matter of the patent, uh, uh, provided that it is uh, fulfilling those particular kinds of criteria. Now, you, some of my friends over here uh, might be thinking that uh, whether uh, all these kind of discussions which we are having, whether there are these kind of filings which are actually taking place, or uh, we are having all these kind of discussions. So I'll just show you them the database of almost uh, of uh, three years from 2016 to 19, which is available on the patent uh, Indian Patent Office website. So you can see uh, the, there is a list of almost 85 pages comprising of almost not less than 15 to 20 inventions on each page. Uh, this is the number of filings which were done only in a time span of three years. You can see how thousands of applications are filed only in one particular country. Let's assume about the status of the biotechnological patenting across the world. Moving forward to it, uh, we know that the uh, drug discovery or any kind of patent, it uh, involves a significant process right from the identification of the issue or problem or the compound to the, uh, uh, then it goes to the validation stage, then it's uh, reached uh, to the preclinical uh, stage, then clinical trials, then formulations, then the dose giving uh, vaccination, all those particular things take place. So in this entire process, a lot of a huge amount of money is invested, a huge amount of skills, labor capital is invested. So to respect them, to protect them, these kind of monopoly rights are very much pertinent and important. So uh, we know that in India, uh, we have uh, basically three kinds of essential criteria for the purpose of patentability. One is the novelty, criteria of novelty, that the invention is not uh, previously made available to the public. Second criteria is the inventive step uh, and the non-obviousness. And the third important card criteria is the industrial application, uh, considering the time, uh, these are basic things I would not be touching upon in great detail. So if we'll be looking into the history uh, in the Indian scenario, then uh, we can probably 
uh, begin with citing the case of the uh, Domenico AG versus uh, controller general, uh, controller of the patents. This was a case in the year 2002. And I will probably say that this was a case which paved the way for the grant of the patent protection on the biotechnological inventions, more particularly in India, uh, because uh, this was a time when the controller uh, of the uh, uh, when control of the patent refused to grant uh, the protection in this particular uh, scenario at that point of time the uh, Calcutta, uh, Kolkata High Court uh, they granted uh, the protection uh, to this particular invention so this was one of the most significant and important case in uh, areas of the biotechnological inventions uh, so uh, this was the in the year 2002 and prior to this also uh, in 2001 uh, another significant step which took place was uh, that India joined the Budapest uh, Treaty on the international recognition of the deposit of the microorganisms for the purpose of the patent protection on 17th of December 2001. So uh, what is the significance of this particular treaty that uh, by being a part of this particular treaty, now India has two important uh, depository authorities in, in our country, uh, one at Nagpur and another at Pune, where under Section 10 uh, requirement of our patent act, we can deposit uh, the samples of our uh, microorganisms or biotechnological inventions related uh, products for the purpose of the patent examination. So these were two important years which paved the way for the biotechnological inventions and their patenting into our country. So we can see there are various kinds of patentable subject matters in these areas, including, uh, let's say, microorganisms. There can be compositions, nucleic acid sequences, antibodies, small molecules, pharmaceutical medicines. They can all be a part of the patentable subject matters, provided they uh, fulfill the three important criteria, that is the novelty, and this, uh, inventive step, and uh, the industrial applicability. So if all these three criteria are uh, fulfilled, then uh, a subject matter of uh, even a biotechnological invention can be a subject matter of the patent protection. So we can take an example, let's say if there's a gene sequence which has certain industrial applicability, uh, and if it satisfies the, all three criteria, they can be a subject matter of the patent protection. So if we look into the claims of the biotechnological inventions, then uh, we can have the product by process claims, sequence claims, combination or the composition claims, but uh, com combination or composition claims sometimes uh, uh, mm, they fall into the trap uh, during the examination process uh, procedures. But uh, the uh, so, uh, here I have listed various kinds of subject matters which can be a part of the biotechnological claims like gene sequences, protein sequences, vectors, uh, gene constructs, uh, microorganisms, um, tissue cultures of plants and animals. Uh, there can be pharmaceutical or vaccines, uh, antibodies, diagnostic kits. They all can be the subject matter of uh, these particular kinds of claims under the biotechnological inventions. But the way is not as smooth as we were seeing uh, so far. There are some of the key issues which are related uh, to the biotechnological patenting into our country. Uh, these uh, include the moral and the ethical concerns, the issues relating to the disclosure of the, uh, for the purpose of the granting of the patent, because when a patent is granted, it is granted in exchange of a disclosure, which is uh, made by the inventor. So to what extent the disclosure is required, or, so there are certain issues relating to that. There are issues relating to the environmental concerns, there are issues relating to the cl uh, cloning of uh, farm animals, stem cells. Uh, so let's try to touch upon some of them in the upcoming slides. So first, let's try to look into the morality issues. So morality is one of the significant issues for the purpose of uh, the biotechnological inventions. Uh, so under Section 3B of the Indian Patent Act, uh, the inventions which are contrary to the morality or those kind of inventions which cause any kind of uh, serious prejudice to the human, animal or the plant life or their health or to the environment, they are non -patent uh, They fall under the category of the non-patentable subject matters and hence they cannot be patented. Let's take the example of um, a process for cloning the human beings or the animals. It is a non-patentable subject matter. Process for modifying the germline of the human beings or uh, for modifying the genetic identity of the animals or these kind of things, they are uh, not uh, protected under the ambit of the patent protection because of this clause section 3B. So uh, that's why the patent office, they are generally suggested to take adequate care while examining the patent ex applications to see that uh, in any way, uh, any kind of patent application is not at all uh, doing the, uh, is intending to have the commercialization on these particular aspects. Uh, 
Similarly, there are exceptions relating uh, to the protection over the scientific principles or the exact theories or the discovery of the living things or the non-living substances. So mere uh, discovery will not uh, suffice for the patent protection. Uh, for uh, the purpose of the patent protection, it is very much important and mandatory that uh, the uh, uh, the invention which on which we are uh, trying to seek protection upon it must qualify the criteria of the inventive step that is uh, it must have either some technological um, uh, uh, some technological development or maybe some economic significance which is uh, not obvious to the person skilled in the art so these are some of the important uh, criteria for uh, the patentability uh, of a particular invention the third important thing uh, for us to be taken care of here is that the concept of evergreening is introduced under the Indian Patent Act under Section 3D, which says that discovery of any new form or known substance, which does not result in the uh, enhancement of the efficacy, those kind of uh, substances, they cannot be a subject matter of the patent protection. So uh, uh, in this particular line, we have the case of Novartis AG versus Union of India, uh, which uh, specifically state that there should be at least theoretic efficacy in order to qualify for the patent protection. Similarly, under Section 3E, it states that a mere ad admixture which results in aggregation or the properties of uh, or a method of making such mere ad admixture that will uh, not suffice for the patent protection. So for this particular purpose, we have the case of Ram Pratap versus Baba Atomic uh, Research Center. So in this case, it was specifically stated that mere um, just a mixing of the features which are already known before the priority date. Uh, so those kind of things will not be uh, a subject matter of the patent protection. So uh, many times in uh, even the uh, companies, uh, they do uh, these kind of admixtures and they try to seek protection on them. So those kind of things are excluded from the uh, protection under the patent. Similarly, under uh, section uh, 3i, it uh, talks about the methods for of the treatment. So any kind of method, like uh, any process for the medicinal, surgical, cur uh, curative, or diagnostic, or therapeutic, or other ways of treatment of human beings, or any process for a similar treatment for the animals that is not a subject matter of the patent protections. So let's say there is a surgical method for search free um, uh, cataract removal. So that is not a subject matter of the patent protection. Similarly, uh, these kind of medicinal methods, etc., they are not uh, protected under the ambit of the patent protection. Uh, going further uh, to it, um, so uh, under 3J, even the plants and animals in whole or any part of them is also not a subject matter of the patent protection or anything which uh, fall under the ambit of the essential biological processes that is also not uh, pat uh, patent protectable under the Indian Patent Act. However, we can protect the microorganisms which satisfy the uh, three essential criteria of the patentability. They can be a subject matter of patent protection, we can deposit the samples of the microorganisms to the depository authorities, which we were discussing under the Budapest uh, Treaty. So uh, this is another important thing uh, which is to be taken care of. And the even the traditional knowledge related inventions, uh, uh, the uh, inventions which uh, are dry, directly trying to protect the traditional knowledge, they will also not be a subject matter of the patent protections. We can take the examples of neem, turmeric, or bitigod, which were uh, tried to be taken protection in the um, uh, Western counterparts, but uh, which were later on uh, either uh, revoked during the opposition proceedings or sometimes during the filing procedure. So similarly, we have the cases even on the protection of the transgenic plants, which is one of the uh, significant issues relating to the biotechnological inventions. So in the case of Monsanto, Monsanto Technology versus Controller General of the Patents and Design, uh, it, it was stated that uh, the transgenic plants, which uh, whose development involves a human intervention on a plant cell or producing uh, the plant cell with some changes. If uh, there is a human intervention in, is involved, then it will fall under outside the scope of the non-patentable subject matter under section 3J, and it can be a subject matter of the patentability. If we uh, briefly just touch upon the international scenario, then uh, under uh, article 27 of the TRIPS agreement, it also excludes some of the important things like uh, the method for the treatments or, uh, or uh, the protection over the plants and animals outside the purview of the patent protections, but again allows the protection over non-biological processes or micro um, uh, biological processes or on the microorganisms. 
I will not go into the details of this scenario at the United States because it has already done or covered by my co-panelists. But in USA, as uh, told by a sir, that uh, it was uh, the case of Diamond was a Chakravarti, which paved the way for the invention of the biotechnological inventions after 1980. Uh, so this is one of the significant case in uh, United States. Uh, apart from it, even the US under the US laws, it grants. Uh, the patent protection to biotechnological inventions, but uh, provided they should strictly uh, qualify the uh, essential criteria, more particularly the uh, criteria of the utility, which is very much uh, importantly looked after uh, by the US patent examiners uh, when it comes to the biotechnological inventions. Similarly, if I touch upon the uh, United Kingdom, then there also. The biotechnological inventions, uh, they can be a subject matter of uh, the patent protection provided that uh, they should uh, include something which uh, comprise of a spark of imagination, something which uh, where the human intervention uh, skill of human being is involved, provided they are also uh, qualifying the essential criteria for the patentability, which are laid down under the UK Patent Act. Similarly, in China also, the claims of, uh, for microorganisms per se, they are allowed in China. Similarly, DNA sequences also, they can be considered uh, under the criteria of the patentability. So, uh, but they, again, they also do not protect uh, the methods for diagnosis or treatment of the diseases or the animal and the plant varieties. They are outside the purview of the patent protection. Similarly, in European Union there also, they have defined the word biological uh, material per se under their laws. And they state that it includes any material which uh, comprises of the, or contains the genetic information or which is capable of reproducing itself or re being uh, reproduced in biological systems. So they have also defined the micro uh, organisms uh, in some of the cases. So. Under Article 53B of the uh, European Patent Conventions, they have given protection to some parts of the biological conventions, but not to the plants or animal varieties or essential biological processes. But uh, the microbiological processes, they can be a subject matter of the patent protection. Similarly, in Japan also, we have the similar kind of scenarios where they have the system of the patent protections on the genetic engineering microorganisms, but they exclude the plants and animals uh, uh, from the purview of the patent protection. So over here in this presentation, I have tried to touch upon a different scenarios, uh, situation of the different countries, uh, how they are treating the biotechnological inventions, and more particularly, more particularly, I have tried to touch upon what kind of biotechnological inventions can be protected in India and under what scenarios they can be bought outside the purview of the biotech uh, uh, biotechnological uh, patent. So yes, the biotechnological uh, inventions can be patented in India, but provided they have to fulfill the essential requirements, they must not fall under the uh, exclusions or what are not patentable subject matters uh, under Section 3 of the Indian Patent Act. They must involve some human intervention for the purpose of its creation, for the purpose of its uh, invention. And they must not be solely a mere discovery, but they should qualify the criteria of a new invention. If these criteria are fulfilled, yes, these kind of biotechnological uh, inventions can be a subject matter under the Indian Patent Act. With this, I would like to rest my presentation and I would like to once again thank you all of you for your active listening and to the organizers, markpatent.org and Rajesh Kumar Acharya, sir, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, sir, for such a thought-provoking presentation. So before moving to the vote of thanks, let me spare some time to special thanks and to appreciate our technical team and a very special thanks to Ms. Krutika Joshi for handling and organizing such a useful webinar. So I now request her to express her thoughts with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be an organizer for this knowledgeable webinar. And thank you, Dr. Acharya, to giving me this opportunity. Thank you. So now I request Ms. Kinjal Shah to appraise this gathering and virtual gathering also with her vote of thanks. 
She is a patent attorney and work with the patent division of HK Acharya and Company. She holds a bachelor qualification in biochemistry from Gujarat University and furthermore a master's degree in science with medical technology from Gujarat University. Her work incorporates prior art search, drafting of patent applications and reply, reply to the office actions. Her training is related basically with the patent indictment and opinion work, essentially in the field of biochemistry. So now I request her to deliver a vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Jalashree. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries assembled over here for this webinar. I'm Kinjal Shah. As uh, we have come to the end of this webinar, I wish to thank all those who have contributed to the successful conduct of this webinar. First of all, I would like to thank the Managing Trustee of MarkPatent.org, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya, for arranging this wonderful webinar. Now, I would like to thank our chief guest, Mr. Sudhir Vaid, who has a renowned uh, biopharmaceutical company as Concord Biotech, and who shared the knowledge about the past scenario of in 1970s, this how it is difficult for us to file a patent in the field of biotechnology uh, fulfilled. And now as time passed in 1995, as WTO allows a product patent. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for this. And now I would like to thank uh, Mr. Padmin Booth as a mentor. Sir, uh, actually, uh, Mr. Padmin Booth, who is a family member of HK Acharya and Company, and he's always a mentor for us. And he said uh, excellent uh, about uh, excellent knowledge about the advanced field of biotechnology. Everyone know about the Indian Patent Law, Section Three, which are strictly uh, non-patentable invention uh, in India. But the thought of Mr. Padmin Booth has said that. Uh, we need to find out what are the uh, uh, what we can uh, what, what can be patentable in India. So this is very important that uh, what are not invention, but what we can uh, what we can file a patent in this field of uh, particular biotechnological invention. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Richard Mitchell, who is not present with us at the time, as he need to catch the flight, but. Uh, I would like to thank that uh, he uh, he shared this knowledge about the two sets of rules or organization at EPC and in EU for direct file of biotech patent. In EPC, not everything is patentable. EPC also excludes the surgery, therapy, and diagnostic method. Also related to human, plants, and animals, which are not patentable in uh, that country. And also said the knowledge about the Article 5 and Article 6, which is an ethical article of EPC, that which are excluded from filing a patent in EPC. As uh, we all know, the Indian patent laws are very stringent compared to other countries. But in uh, this year, the knowledge about the EPC and EU for particularly a biotechnological invention. So thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Mario Golab, who has shared their knowledge about a biotechnological invention, particularly uh, what are the what are not patentable in US. In US also, a surgical process or in therapeutic method or diagnostic method are not patentable. And how uh, in 1980 the government passed the rule that anything under the sun that is made by the man is patentable. And how it changed by time to time in 2011 and in 2013. And he shared the knowledge about the genetically modified mouse or an onco mouse. And he shared their wonderful knowledge about a gene patent. So thank you so much, Mr. Gola, for such a thought provoking information. Now I would like to thank Mr. Yung Jung Kwan uh, sir, you shared a wonderful information about a biomedical and pharmaceutical patents in Korea. Uh, he shared a uh, wonderful information about a uh, uh, U.S. and Korean patent laws. As uh, he shared a well-renowned uh, case law about Estella's Pharma versus Core Pharma, uh, in which 
they how the korean government ruled that new drug produced by a changing or replacing a salt with other salt but still comprising the same active ingredient as a patented drug that constitute a patent infringement of a, that patented drug so this is a very informative information and uh, how uh, lastly they shared that uh, knowledge about be not a movie maker but be an inventor so thank you so much sir uh, for this uh, wonderful information and last i would like to thank mr dilip sharma who has shared their knowledge about a biotechnical industry in india first of all they share about a biological and uh, first of all they share the classical biotechnological sector and modern biological sector and the scenario of 2016 to 2019 uh, indian patent uh, about thousands of patent that were filed by uh, for particularly drug and particularly for biotechnological in, uh, invention and they shared the knowledge about the history of our indian patent uh, law that how our uh, india become the member of the budapest treaty and uh, uh in past in uh, 2002 how the microorganism is valid in india and uh, the main major key issues related to a biotechnological invention regarding section 3b 3c 3d 3e 3i 3j and traditional knowledge so thank you so much sir and also uh, mr dilip sharma shared that major countries uh, a uh, patent laws about a biotechnological field sir thank you so much for providing such a knowledgeful information and uh, i would like to thank the sponsors hk acher and company the co organizers zavier's research foundation icfai law school hyderabad us lgu and us iic and last nirma university institute of law for their whole hearted support as a co organizer in organizing this webinar I will be failing in my duties if I do not express my sincere appreciation to the technical team of markpatent.org for enabling the smooth conduct of this webinar. Last but not the least, a big thank to all the participants who have taken off uh, uh, to participate and for making this webinar a big success. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am. in closing i wish to express my gratitude to all the delegates and observers for their full cooperation and active participation i would like to thank all the wonderful people who spoke and enlightened us with their amazing knowledge and ideas it's been an honor to be among such an accomplished individuals thank you all for your patience we are privileged to have in attendees such a distinguished expert as well as observers having such resourceful and knowledgeable delegates which have helped us to gain insight on strengthening mechanism as a means of promoting ipr with regard to patenting biotech and biomedical research we convey our sincere appreciation to our distinguished guests who have been actively participating from all the way across the globe to make this webinar a huge success i wish dr golab a very good morning and a blessed day and mr sudhir wait mr padmin boot dr rajesh kumar acharya mr dilip sharma and mr yujun kwan a very good evening with this we sum up our session thank you ladies and gentlemen wish everyone to stay home and stay safe bye everybody thank you bye bye